Welcome to episode three of Perspectives. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, you'll notice I have this little contraption here, and that is just because I am trying to get better audio. They say that if you don't have great audio, your video could be a masterpiece, but the audio will definitely be a deal breaker for many people. So trying to get some better audio for everybody. I'm hoping that some of these other conversations that I've had in Perspectives uh, has helped spark a little bit of creativity for you in your own business concepts. I think every single um, episode of Perspectives has some snippet of gold that I think is worth a takeaway for every single person. And it might not be the same, the same piece of gold, but I think there is something to be said about some of these amazing conversations that I'm having with great people from inside and outside of the hospitality industry. Which leads me to this conversation. This conversation is very, very exciting because we're talking about this concept of self-transcendence. In my own personal life, I had never even heard of this topic or term, and it really, really is quite something. And it's more important because Kylie, who is the person we'll be hearing from today, she considers herself an industry activist. So she is going to be on a mission to try and get hospitality folks to understand this concept of self-transcendence within the hospitality context because she believes that with this concept we can actually have a more fulfilling workplace. So that's really, really interesting and I'm definitely curious to hear your thoughts, your ideas and experiences around this topic after you hear the conversation with us. Uh, last but not least, shout out to Pablo. Pablo, thank you so much for introducing me to Kylie. Um, this was a great conversation. So without further ado, here is the conversation that I had with Kylie on self-transcendence. So today's topic is all about self-transcendence, but I think before we even go into that and what that means and all of that, I think we need to step it back, you know, quite, quite a bit here. So I'm curious to know from your side, um, what problem were you seeing in the hospitality industry and are you continuing to see this, um, COVID aside, not, not related to COVID, um, that has led you to even be interested in self-transcendence? Um, what is that problem? Okay, so uh, what I see is that um, probably when I started to even understand what service actually means, you know, when, when we go into restaurants or where we go into a hotel, you find that the interaction with people, um, it's very minimal. So it, it, it sounds a little bit more transactional, I would say, because it's like um, a give and take situation. Okay. where you know they know that they're there to provide you with let's say your room keys or your menu or mm -hmm. your your meal for the day and you know it's just a touch and go service okay um, style of service I would say and um, it does not feel warm yeah. it does not feel you know like you've been cared for sure and when I feel that way it, it feels a little bit not right because when you hear about service from books, from movies, uh, you do want to experience that care mm -hmm. where it's provided to you. And um, that's where I found that the human touch or, or you know, even just the interaction with people just became very minimal. Mm -hmm. And that's where I find like one of the biggest problems with service these days is that it's transactional. Mm -hmm. They just do the job because they have to do the job. Yeah. You know? um, I find so, that really interesting because if I think about examples from me just going to a restaurant, let's say, even though it's, it's meant to seem like it's warm and friendly, it does come across robotic because the next time I go in, I'm, get, I'm being given the same speech that the last person gave me. Um, so I, I think you're, you're, you do make sense when you say that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's because some people, I think, I wonder if they would argue this other side and say, you know what, but we train all our staff to be friendly and, and to go out there and interact with our, our guests. So, you know, I, I'm thinking from their standpoint, they're, they're not really understanding that there is still this transactional way of going about it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I feel that training is uh, a double-edged sword right so mm -hmm. training when you train your staff they are competent to do the work mm -hmm. they're competent to say let's say if we are in a restaurant right the host 
welcomes you. Hi, welcome to ABC restaurant, you know, and then they seat you at your table, uh, requested or non-requested. And then they's like, okay, I'm going to bring you the menu now. And they will give you the spiel of like what's special for today, a soup of the day, for example. And then they leave you. Right. Right. And then the waiter comes in, takes your order and then serves you the food. And that, that is being trained because, you know, that's the minimum standard the, the restaurant or the establishment actually expects you to do mm-hmm. because it gets the job done. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, I think about, um, you know, having worked in a restaurant myself, you know, with all the amounts of covers that could possibly come in on one night, it's hard to imagine how you can still continue to go above and beyond when you're like, okay, I have five tables. They all need something like, let me run back and forth to the kitchen. Oh no, they got this order wrong. And have they been seated or their menu? Like, you know, there's so much to, to be looking at um, in that context. So it's actually quite interesting because right now I am working at a restaurant and it's a very, very busy restaurant in Singapore. And uh, I, I guess in a way, you know, I put my own words into test. Mm. right and what I realize is that all you need to do is just to spend that minimal amount of time at the start when you seat your guests or when you first interact with the guests when all you need to do is just give that little touch at first and you start to build this um, flow of anticipation Mm -hmm. of their needs as long as you begin right at the start but if you do it like in the middle, it gets awkward because then they were like, oh, all of a sudden you're friendly. Why is it? Because you're free. But if you started right at the beginning, that interaction actually builds the connection immediately with mm-hmm. you and your customer or your guest. And um, I, I feel that that actually, you know, just gives you that um, edge above anybody else doing service as we call today, mm-hmm. um, which is transactional. Yeah. So yeah, it, yeah, that what is- I usually, you know, it's just to, let's say, um, instead of just telling you about what's my specials, you know, I, I actually ask you, hey, how are you doing today? Mm. Isn't it good to have like a drink midday, you know? Yeah. And they get taken by surprise because it's not what people are used to anymore. Mm. Everyone's used to very transactional service. They're like, yeah, just give me the menu. It's mm. fine. You know, I know exactly what I want. But then right. you actually create the edge just by creating the first connection. And it's, that's something that I feel, you know, it, it just um, makes things yeah. a lot friendlier if you want to put it back. But you can't train this. Yeah. And it's interesting because when I think of the word hospitality, like that's what I'm thinking about. You come into a space and it's almost like you walked into someone's home and you want to feel that level of comfort and familiarity and you want that. You don't want to just come in and somebody being like, yeah, here's your water. I'll be back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that's where, um, you know, I find that it's, it's crippling for the industry and actually it cripples not just in the point of view of a customer, Mm -hmm. but actually the point of view for a hospitality professional. Mm -hmm. Because when you do that, you're just moving in motion of um, the work, but then you do not establish yourself in a place of value. Mm -hmm. You don't put yourself up on an expert pedestal where you, you say, hey, I can provide, but rather you're just reacting to whatever the customer is, you know, asking for. And then you become like a receiver of commands rather than somebody who provides a service. And that's yeah. uh, how I feel. So That's a really good example that, because it just makes me think of somebody that I used to work with specifically. And this person used to tell me that when he worked in hospitality and he sat on, on the edge of hospitality where he was making minimum wage. So he was already struggling in his job and he had to get a second part-time job, but he just always told me that he felt as if he was being treated like a slave and, and maybe that's not the right terminology to be using, but I guess he felt like he was always less than the customer and that the customer was always the one who he had to be, you know, on his hands and knees ready to serve um, rather than like, I am doing a job that I feel really proud of. And this is more of a collaboration kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. So I have a saying, well, I, I guess I maybe I come up with like quite a few quotes of my own, right? And one of the things that I say that, you know, providing service in hospitality is not subservient 
which mm-hmm. is like what you have a friend or your ex colleague actually said, you know, to feel yeah. like a slave. Right. But you know, it's it's providing a service. Mm-hmm. But you're not subservient to your customers. You have yeah. to put yourself in a very empowered position because at the end of the day, when they walk into your establishment, it's like walking into your home, like you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. And who knows your home better than you? Yeah. Right? It's not your customers, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. if you treat the place that you work, the establishment that you work at as a place of your own, then you become the expert. Mm-hmm. And then you should be the one who's sharing with them, like, this is what I have. Yeah. And this is all I've got. You know, I'm giving it all to you. This is where the bedroom is, the, the bathroom is, you know, uh, and, and you should know better. And that makes you already the expert. Yeah. It puts you already on a platform. So why do we have to take the commands instead of educating them? Because yeah. we, we are already naturally in a powered position Mm -hmm. by having more product knowledge or by having more knowledge than them. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. I, uh, it just, it, it really gets my, my blood pumping in the best way, just because thinking about, especially right now in, in times of COVID where everybody is just so separated when we can actually come back into hospitality establishments very regularly, um, rather than just separated or outdoor dining, um, this is going to be very, even more important than it was before, because I now, when I go out somewhere, I don't want to just feel like a number somewhere. You know, I really want to be able to make that human connection and doesn't matter if I'm, if I'm paying the money or they're paying the money, like I just want that human connection. And I think that this is going to help hospitality brands um, because I, in terms of getting that repeat customer, because people are going to want to feel like they are, are part of something bigger rather than just coming in for that transaction. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things is that, you know, we we don't treat people like they are table numbers or Mm -hmm. confirmation numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we're all human. Right. And Mm -hmm. it's a human interaction. You know, it's, it's human interaction between me and you, uh, me and a customer. And uh, it's really important because I mean, why would we want to feel like a number, you know, okay, you're my fifth table. I'm, I'm assisting today. I'm, busting my bum Mm -hmm. you know to do this for you but then you feel discontent in your heart as well because you feel that you're always being told what to do Mm -hmm. but actually you know when you rise above that you can actually do it for somebody else and that's actually where transcendence come in yeah yeah Tell, tell us a little bit about that so obviously i think we've set the stage in terms of like here are some of the things that have that have not been going so well but what is self transcendence exactly Okay, uh, self transcendence actually was a concept that I, I guess is a term that came to me when I was in school, maybe 15 years ago or so, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we were studying the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm-hmm. Um, usually, Maslow's hierarchy of needs ends at self actualization, which is uh, probably the most famous part of Maslow's theory because everybody wants to have the desire to become more than, you know, what the, the most that they can be. They want to have that sense of achievement, fulfillment, and growth, right? Mm-hmm. So that's self-actualization. But then before Maslow died, I guess, you know, he, he started to feel that he, um, he's done so much for humanity and he came up with the last part, self-transcendence, which actually people call it the hidden part of Maslow's hierarchy of need. Mm-hmm. Now what self-transcendence actually is defined in, uh, in his theory is to rise above yourself and to relate to issues that are greater than yourself. Mm. So basically, in very layman's term, is to do something good for another person. Mm. Um, and I think we all have experienced that in one way or another in our lives because I, I believe ultimately humanity is kind. Yeah. And when we do something nice for somebody else, we actually feel better than when somebody pays us money to do it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember um, when I was working in hospitality, in operations, mm-hmm. I felt like when I had my time with the front desk, for example, the people who were genuinely passionate about working at the front desk, mm-hmm. they really, truly felt good about themselves at the end of the day because they knew that they had helped somebody that day or that they had turned someone's emotions around when they walked the, through the door. And it really is a powerful uh, sense of accomplishment when you can do something really nice for somebody else. It's, it's amazing. It is. It really is. Um, and 
I know that working in the front desk because you know we, we both did operations work before and when you work at a busy hotel you probably check in maybe like 40 people at least or mm. 50 or you know if you have like occupancy of let's say if you have a massive hotel and, and each of you have to do about 100 check-ins a day mm-hmm. you would find it quite exhausting and repetitive yes definitely <laughs> Oh I, yeah. I, I don't discount the fact that it's repetitive and it's exhausting because mm-hmm. it's busy operations. It's and that makes it transactional. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but then the minute we move into that autopilot mode, we start to treat our customers as a number. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one of the easiest thing to remember is that everybody that you face And the queue will be massive. We have a massive lobby, imaginary lobby in our head. The queue will be massive. But every time you have a new person in front of you, you have to reset the counter and it becomes number one again. Mm -hmm. It's not number 59 that I've checked in today, but it always has to be number one again because they deserve the same attention that you give the first person that you met. Yeah whether or not they're number one, number 59, or number 99, or, well, number 100 will be the best because, you know, it, they will be like, yes, finally, my last customer. <laughs> okay, I'm done with this shift, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> But then again, you know, it, it's really not about being a number because everybody deserves that fair um, attention. They, if you want to talk about it in a numer- like a, um, why do they deserve it? They probably paid as much money. Mm-hmm to experience the same kind of experience as the first person or the last person that arrived at your hotel or your right. establishment, uh, any establishment that you work at. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, but everybody just deserves it. And for you, if you put in that effort, you would feel that, hey, you know, I've really, really now done my best, mm-hmm. right? But we just let it fly by our heads because gosh, I have 101 things to do apart from just checking you in. I have to do your paperwork. I have to make sure that your rooms are clean and there's all this kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, um, just being really real with your interaction at the end of the day, um, you, you actually get forgiven a lot more when you're a little bit more vulnerable and real with your interaction. Yeah, if you can't do something, people are actually a little bit more accommodating than when you use a verbiage on them. Yes. I a thousand percent agree. It's, it's like you just, I think especially now in this day and age of social media and all this fake news, whatnot, people are yes. looking for transparency. So if, yes. even if you don't know the answers, like you said, and you just come to them and say, Hey, you know what? I actually don't know, but I will be sure to find out for you. And you just come with that level of raw authenticity. You're right. People will be more forgiving. Um, and it, it really does make for a better human interaction because you don't just come with this robotic answer of, you know, I, I will look into this. Um, I'll get back to you in five minutes kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, just be real. Uh, verbiages are there to guide you. They're not there to, you know, dictate what you have to say. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, a common misunderstanding for um, the learners mm-hmm. as well as the trainers. Yeah. who actually do deliver this kind of programs for, let's say, hotels or restaurants. You know, we, we tell them that, okay, you have to say this, 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 is this. But actually, you make everybody turn into robots mm-hmm. that's working for you. And that's how, you know, automation is going to take over us, right? Technology is going to come. <laughs> yeah, you can't fake that real interaction where you actually truly care because a robot yeah. wouldn't care about how you feel. Right, right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Is, so is it about just having... Like if, if you were going to come in and train a company, would you say to them, hey, I think it's good that you have a basis, a, a guideline, some outlines of what people need to do, but they shouldn't be given a piece of paper with from hi, how are you all the way down to we'll, we'll see you next time kind of thing. Yep. So when I, if I were to do a training, then I would actually maybe make everyone write their own, like think about what you would say in scenarios, you know, like you do case scenario basis Mm -hmm. and say what what would happen if somebody came up to you like this there's no right or wrong answer but I just want to know how you really feel yeah or just reverse the roles and say what if somebody came up to you and said this you know what would you have preferred them say to you sure sure and that makes sense um yeah and it's a good practice for people because I think 
in, in one of your other podcasts. I don't know if you were featured or if it was your own, um, but you had mentioned something about the next generation of people um, who are coming up, who are very much in this world of technology, who might not get, you know, they're not used to interacting with people the way that other generations might have been. So, yeah, I'm curious to know, like, what are steps that people can actually take to kind of come out of that to be able to, to deliver that kind of experience? Hmm, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, there, there are many things that we can do. So one of the things is really to educate yourself first. Mm -hmm. And if we were to just rewind back to what we started earlier, we talk about yeah. being the expert of your own establishment. Mm -hmm. When you actually value what you do, um, and you know that you are the expert of whatever you have to offer, I think it starts from there. Mm -hmm. Because it puts you on a level of confidence and when you interact with your, your guest, you know, you feel that, but I know my stuff. I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's not in a place of being unsure sure. that I always have to go and check. Now, we, we are not, we're not always going to know all the answers mm -hmm. but we know what our, cap our capabilities can stretch till yeah. right so when you put yourself in a place of value I, I believe whatever you say becomes more authentic because mm -hmm. you know what you have um, the other thing is to prepare yourself for, for an interaction like this there there's a few things that I I say there's uh, three components that we need to use in our body parts, our heads. That's where the knowledge comes in. Mm -hmm. Our hands, always be proactive to do something. And then using your heart, because that's where all the energy stems from. And then you have to use your heart to actually think about the situation and put yourself into that situation. Um, fortunately, this generation that's coming up, that's going to be joining our industry, they are actually more forthright. Mm -hmm. Because they have less tact in the way they speak because you know everything is so quick and um the instant gratification of typing a text you know and it goes really quickly and you know how fast we type on our phones um i feel that they are actually with less tact you also have more authenticity mm -hmm. yeah but That's then you have to stem from a place of you know uh, you have to stem from a good place and not being defensive and you're only defensive when you you actually have uh, you feel attacked so you yeah. cannot feel attacked and that's why you need to leverage your your own um, self-worth or yeah. your value how you think about your job sure. um, and that that part the head part the product knowledge part is it's got to do with um, I would say training yes mm -hmm. but also how much you have a desire to learn mm. On your job so if you just passively take in information you will never know more than what you already do so always educate yourself a little bit more be curious mm -hmm. and then you can actually you know speak with a place of confidence and and that makes you actually a lot more prepared sure. to handle situations like that yes so do you think that coming into this into the hospitality industry it's very important that people already have a passion for it or is it just that they have to have those soft skills that are that are willing to be like molded a little bit do you already need to have a passion for it uh ideally in an ideal perfect world i would say hopefully so <laughs> <laughs> but that's not gonna happen i mean you know uh, i would love for everyone to have the passion for hospitality but i think you know, it's one of those jobs where you really don't need to have much qualifications to get into. And, you know, a lot of us do it in our university days or like in high school and we need an extra job, a few yeah. extra bucks to go out and have fun with our friends. And we do like part-time jobs or we, right. we take on, um, you know, roles like this so that we get some money. It's yeah. an easy way to get money. Not a lot. Yeah. But man, you can build that and well I think the people who are passionate in the industry should speak up and actually become the role models mm -hmm. because your examples or your actions can actually inspire the next generation to say hey actually I really love this job you know I have friends who actually came in just wanting money but they stayed in the job for 
let's say the next 30 years of their lives, perhaps even, right? And just because they had a good manager, they had somebody who showed them like the fulfillment of being in that job. Mm -hmm. And that's why you stay in it. Yeah. And, And that's incredible because, you know, I never, you know, when I got into this industry, I really didn't truly understand that it was a career path that you could choose. And there were people who were in this for 20, 30, 40, 50 plus years. Um, and I guess if we want to be that next generation of leaders ourselves, or, you know, even if you have been in the industry for a while, there's still time to still be that leader who inspires. So I guess if we bring it back to this, this topic of self transcendence, um, what, what steps do we need to take to actually achieve that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So self transcendence, basically rising above yourself. And if you find that it's your career path, right? Usually we stop at like, I want to be a manager. I want to, I want to be uh, the general manager of hotel. I want to, I want to own my own restaurant. Right. And Mm -hmm. that will give you that goal that you have uh, actualized once you have achieved it. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you move into transcendence, it means that you're going to be able to share whatever you already have, right? And whatever you know, you are willing to share 100% Mm -hmm. with the next person. And one of the things I feel is that a lot of trainers actually keep, let's say they share like 90% and they keep that 10% to themselves. Yeah. Just so that I am a little bit smarter than you, you know? And <laughs> yeah. I don't... <laughs> no, so I, many, I, I mean, myself included. I'm sure I do that too. Yeah, but, you know, but the thing is, I, I believe that when we want to groom the next generation, we give 100% and we, we have to act on our own words. We have to do as we say. Yeah. We set the example and people follow the good examples. If you set a bad example, they're going to follow the bad examples too. Yeah. Right? So if I had a manager who actually um, yells at a guest, generally, I'm going to, I'm going to, my mind is going to say, it's okay to yell at my guest. Mm -hmm. Right? Or if I have a manager who's always giving free food or free upgrades or free um, champagne every day to their favorite guests, I'm going to think it's okay to do it. Mm Mm-hmm because they've set the example. So transcendence in a way where you share whatever you have and your best practices to um, the next generation by emulating the actions by yourself first. Sure. Yeah, I like that transcendence is about, it's it's not just about you anymore. It's about the whole and everybody who's involved. And I think that's one of the most incredible things about self-transcendence. I also wanted to just ask, um, you know, self-transcendence doesn't necessarily have to be just for people who are sitting at the top of a ladder, let's say, for example. Um, It can be anybody. It can be the dishwasher. You as a dishwasher have the power to actually self-transcend. But what does that look like from other other staff members? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Let's say... I think almost every establishment has a, a level of empowerment or like a, for, for their staff, they tell them like, you know, if, if something goes wrong, you can take it off the bill, da, da, da. Mm-hmm. Um, you can give them a free shot of tequila if it's their birthday, or you can <laughs> give them like a plate of fruits, you know, and that's like a standard empowerment thing because they want you to have a level of confidence to give something to a guest just to, and the, the, um, the, the point of doing that for an establishment is because they, they're trying to instill confidence in you, mm-hmm. right? But the reason why you do it is different. Actually, we don't need to give anything free, right? Mm-hmm. For anybody right. to make their experience. People are willing to pay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, you know, but if you spoil your guests, they, they actually expect it from you. Let's put it in a very layman term, like a, let's say um, dishwasher, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, and you are washing the dishes and uh, your job, you get paid to wash dishes. And when you finish washing the dishes, you feel like, okay, my job is done for the day. Transactional job is done. Yeah. But today you know that operations are ex- it's extremely busy. Mm-hmm. And you know your, your, your colleagues are running around the area and hey, the tubs of dishes are not coming in. Do you automatically think, should I go out there and help my team and maybe help them collect the dishes? 
mm-hmm. and bring it in because they don't have time to run the dishes in. Now, this is not because you have to finish your work because at the end of the day, you're going to finish your work anyway. But now you're doing an extra step to help your colleagues and you're going to walk out of your station of dishwashing and you're going to go pick up all those buckets and say, hey guys, don't worry, I'm going to bring back a fresh bucket for you. Mm-hmm. That is like in a minuscule way of self-transcendence itself because wow. you're helping your team. Mm-hmm. And that's in a very, very basic level of doing it, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Everybody can do it. (laughs) And I think that's a really important part to highlight because some people, well, I mean, if I think back to, you know, Maslow's hierarchy, for example, sometimes people might think, well, I, I have, I have two jobs, you know, I'm so stressed. I have to take three buses just to get to work. Like I don't have time for self-transcendence because I'm just trying to survive. So in, in that terminology, I think the example you just gave, is, is a good way to show, like, I mean, it's not a great situation for that person to be in, but they still have that power to self-transcend. I think that's, that's amazing. And all you need to do is think for another person and outside of your own. Mm-hmm. So actually, it's super easy to do it because all of us would have done it for one person or another. And every day we might have already been self-transcending. But, you know, when you think about it in a concept of being at work in hospitality and hospitality is a family work. Yeah. We mm-hmm. all work like we're in a team, we're in a family. And the minute you have one part of the chain broken, mm-hmm. operations is going to go flat. Right. Right. Because you don't have a flow anymore. Um, then this is the part where I say that the culture and the mindset of any, any establishment should be built in a way where like teamwork is the dream work. Mm-hmm. It's, it's something every establishment would tell you. They will tell you that we're a family, we're a team, no, no, no. But do you actually behave like you're part of a family? Do you actually behave like you're part of a team? Yeah. Um, when, you, when someone calls for help, you know that the minute somebody calls for help, it means that they're already dying mm. inside. You know? yeah. But if you don't allow them to call for help, you'll notice because you say like, hey, you know, I care for the staff outside. I'm going to go check on them. Mm-hmm. Before they even say like, oh my God, help me. I'm, I'm drowning. I'm, I'm just bummed with customers, right? Yeah. And, and that makes everything smoother as well. Right. Oh, wow. I mean, I'm just thinking, imagine if every single person on the team, ha- you know, really put forward this idea of self-transcendence, like how much more we could actually achieve instead of just leaving it to one or two people to do. Oh. Yeah. Like, I would love to see this. <laughs> um, I would love for, for every team to have that, you know, but um, <laughs> innately, sometimes you would say human, we're, we're, we're kind, yet we're selfish, right? There's yeah. always two sides of the coin. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was reading um, one of the articles that you sent me, and I think one of the, there was a quote in there from somebody who was giving an example of self-transcendence, and I think it really resonated with me, which is, that it's not about competing with other people when it comes to self-transcendence. It's really just about competing with yourself on, are you a better person today than you were yesterday? Are you doing something better to help keep you growing kind of thing? And I thought that was like, that's a great perspective to have. You know, if you put your mindset in that perspective, it changes the the, the game, so to speak. It really does. It really Mm -hmm. does. We just have to be a little bit better than we were yesterday, or we have to be a little bit better than we were an hour ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just keep moving, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> and you can see, I mean, I don't know if this is an example of self-transcendence per se, but I've seen, um, uh, a, I think it was a, a busser coming to clean tables, and this person really made it. It's just so fun. You know, you could go to a table and just like clear the dishes and be like, gosh, why do I have this job? Like, this is awful. But this person really went over to the tables and did a whole dance routine while they were cleaning the tables. It made it fun for that person. But also the people who were guests sitting around were like, oh, this is a fun place to be like to dine at, you know, it was like a little level of entertainment. And again, I don't know if that's self-transcendence, but that person really brought extra life into their work. And I, I believe, you know, maybe this person might feel that I'm, I'm doing a job, right? I may not have to love my job, but I, I have to do it because I love myself. Mm-hmm. I want to have fun doing it, Yeah. right? No matter how 
you're a busser, right? You know, you have to clear dirty dishes. You have to clear um, chicken, chicken bones or something, okay, off the table. And, and it's not the most glamorous job in the world, yeah? Yeah. But when you do that little dance, when you, when you entertain your guests a little, who's going to be the one smiling at the end of the day? It's the guests, right? Mm-hmm. And you. Yeah. You're, you're smiling because you're feeling good about it, right? But mm-hmm. you made them smile, and that is transcendence. It is. I, I mean, that's, that's just so great. And, you know, I also, yeah, that's, and that's it. And these are really great examples for people to understand that you don't have to, let's say, necessarily move up the, the ladder of this Maslow's hierarchy. This is all integrated within as you keep moving forward. Um, and I think I, I kind of just like what you said earlier as well as having conversations with guests in the very beginning when you're there. And it makes me think that, you know, I wonder if, if more, let's say, bussers, dishwashers, or other people who don't necessarily interact with guests very often, if they had that opportunity or, or came out of their comfort zone to say something to, our, to the guests, if they'd have more of a, of a more positive experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, now, transcendence doesn't always have to be with your guests, right? Okay. It can be with your team. It can be your colleagues. So if you're a busser, you, you may work closely with um, the service team. You may work closely with the kitchen. Yeah. And when you do that transcendence thing, you know, your energy is infectious, mm-hmm. right? And you actually lift the mood of the people who are working with you as well. So it's, it's every interaction. It's not necessarily with your guests. So mm-hmm. it's your sphere of influence that you have to transcend to it like yeah. provide the self-transcendence experience to it. But then again, you know, it's self-transcendence, right? So it's up to you because at the end of the day, the person who receives the, uh, the most fulfillment, it's not them, it's actually you. Yeah. Yeah, but you have to do that little act to actually influence the people around you to, to radiate that energy. Um, as simple as coming to work with a big smile and giving everyone high fives and say, hey, let's rock and roll. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like, I like how you just shifted that. It doesn't that. really matter. Just now you said it, it's, I mean, yes, we are paying attention to our guests. Yes, they are important. They are the customers who are paying us. But I like that you just said, it's not necessarily about them. It is about us and the fulfillment that we are going to receive from, from taking these actions. Um, and I think that alone, well, it could feed into some people's egos a little bit, which makes it more likely that they might be more willing to be part of self-transcendence. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still that, that wholeness, I think. Because like you said, if somebody is doing an amazing job and they're having a great day, it's that ripple effect of their energy feeding off to their team and then their team feeding off to the guests and then the guests going out into the world having a great experience and it, you know, it just keeps going from there. Yeah, exactly. It's, um, there is a, a movie, right? I think, what's that movie called with uh, the one, Pass It Forward, is it? Oh, Pay It Forward. Pay It Forward, yeah. Yep. So, like, you know, one, one act of kindness will ripple effect and you just keep doing and the next person will actually do another act of kindness for another person. Pretty much, that's pretty much it, right? Yeah. Um, I also think maybe self-transcendence or transcendence in hospitality does not necessarily mean that you know we uh, it does not have a monetary value to it Mm -hmm. directly Mm -hmm. right but when you provide that kind of service with a place of care um, naturally humans we as humans will be drawn to that energy and that's Mm -hmm. where we come back so I, I read a quote actually quite recently about transcendence where I'm doing a bit of research that mm-hmm. actually self-actualization where we want to fulfill our goals and you mm-hmm. know, all the part where it's extrinsic, um, ex- the extrinsic fulfillment that we get yeah. actually is just a subset of self-transcendence because when you have the intrinsic fulfillment, you're happy to do it every day mm-hmm. and it keeps you motivated. It keeps you, um, it keeps you, going and you want to do better and you want to do more it's addictive yeah and then the money comes back in as self-actualization you will fulfill your goals eventually right so it self-actualization is a bit of a little brother of transcendence yeah. because instead of thinking about like how am i going to make money how am i going to make money but you're thinking about what good can i do 
Mm-hmm. And when you do good, people come back to you because they're drawn to goodness as well. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's a really good way to put it because, you know, I'm, I'm also thinking about those, let's say, business owners who are thinking, well, you know, self-transcendence is nice, but how do we actually monitor if, if it's working? And I think this is a, a great example of you're doing all these self-transcendence things with you and your team by having all these repeat customers that's where you're like, oh, we're getting more money coming in. And it's because of this. Um, so that's a really good example. It's not directly measurable to anything, right? Right. We can't put, we can't put a level of measurements. I mean, hotels have a survey that they send to their guests at the end of the stay. You know, they rate the people, the product, uh, the place, mm-hmm. you know, our four piece, basically our price, right? Yeah, yeah. And every time you see them rate the people, they were like, yeah, the people are nice, but you know, everybody rates the people as nice. Or mm-hmm. did you get the service that you really want? One out of five. And half the time people put three because it's like, mm, I don't really feel it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if every single person you meet is going to give you that, hey, great experience, that good vibe, you're going to leave that place and you're going to be like wowed by it. Mm-hmm. We can't really measure it in one to five you know, like yeah. from fair experience or like really poor to really good experience. We can't really, really ex- experience, but you know how it feels like when you're treated right. You know how it feels like when you've been treated well. And at the end of the day, when you feel, when you leave a place and you feel happy, mm. there's no way you're going to say fair service. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? there's no way. There's no way, <laughs> there's no way you're fair service. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, uh, Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, Because yeah, I think the most dangerous kind of survey that you can receive back if you receive a feedback form that just has neutral. Yeah, I mean, it clearly, I mean, you're not doing well, I mean, you're not doing bad, but that doesn't, that's not great. It doesn't give you any idea what you're doing right or wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't know how to measure it. It's a feeling. We can't measure our feelings. We can't say like, I feel 70% good today, Yeah, you know? But yeah. when you feel good, you know you feel good. Mm-hmm. We can't put yeah. a number to it, yeah? Yeah, so, it's, yeah. It, uh, yeah, I used to work at this, at this um, company and it was, a, it was a private membership club for people in the creative industries. And I just remember every time I walked th- through the door as an employee, I was given this feeling like it was this amazing feeling of being part of something incredible outside of myself. And I wanted, I wanted more hospitality businesses to do this because I just thought you, you're get, they're getting so many members who are repeats because they also are experiencing, experiencing this feeling, but from a customer or a guest standpoint. But if you can actually provide that for your employees where they feel incredible every single time they walk through those doors that's the company helping, I think, to empower their own staff to want to self-transcend because they're like, this. I get this feeling and I just want to keep it going. So can I ask, Andrea, what, what did this company do differently from any other establishments that you've actually worked at? Well, I think it all starts with the onboarding, um, but it was also a boutique-style establishment. So it was different and it was, it was like niche. So I wasn't cookie cutter. And I think that was the one thing first that, that grabbed me first. But then it was this onboarding of just telling everybody how amazing the company is and actually following, following through on those actions. It wasn't just sitting us through a presentation and saying, here's what the company is like. And then you, ask, you start working and then all of a sudden it's completely different. It's a mess. Everything was very transparent from the beginning and it, they followed through on what they were preaching. And I think that was one of the big, biggest steps of, of creating this feeling. So it's the culture scape of the company, right? And mm. that people are actually having the right mindset. Um, what about the people who worked with you then? What were they like? Well, it depended on the position. Um, so for example, people who got to work directly with these members, because these members were the ones who were paying big money to be in there. So they, you were, you were almost rubbing elbows with, exclusive celebrities or people who you normally wouldn't have access to. So these people who worked in the front line positions felt very empowered and excited. But the people who, who worked behind the scenes or didn't get to interact with these people, they were the ones who felt like they 
were less than, or they, they weren't deserving enough because they weren't allowed to be in the other positions, which I found interesting. Mm -hmm. Interestingly so, I guess, um, the back office, we call the back office, mm. right? People in the back office always may feel like um, they may not have the glamorous side of the job. Yeah. Yeah. But they are the backbone of whatever we do. So imagine if that energy that, you know, the people who are working in the front line bring it back to the back of house and say like, hey guys, you know, it's because of you guys that we have the ability to give everything. So then the communication goes backwards again, right? And when they do something or they share the stories and say like, this is what happened today, you know, and, and um, thank you for arranging everything because I would not have done it this smoothly because of you. Yeah. And then yeah. they feel valued and that's where, you know, as team gets better, we actualize our goals, but also putting the right people at the right places. Mm -hmm. If they really want to go out there and meet people, then maybe you should put them out there, mm -hmm. right? And then we hire people who are really, really good at arranging stuff to do things on the inside so they feel fulfilled. And then they can go out of their little boxes to do that extra mile service that we're talking about yeah. uh, for the people they are working with mm -hmm. so that the people they're working with can do better jobs for who they are working for right? Or what they are working for. So then again, we go back to the flow of things again. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned earlier, like, do we need to hire people who are already passionate about the job? I okay. don't really think so, but you need to put people where they should be. That's a great point. That is a really great point. Cause I was actually having a conversation with somebody not that long ago on exactly this and saying is having or giving people the opportunity to, let's say cross departmentally train just for a day even so that they can see what it's like to see if it's something that they'd want to pursue. Maybe the managers are noticing that they have a level of skill that would fit better in a different department, you know, but if we don't allow that creativity or those opportunities, um, yeah, I think it can be, it can discourage a lot of people. Right. Definitely. And I guess this is just the way of hiring, right? You know, we have to hire for a certain role. Um, everything is, based on your job description and we apply for jobs you know just to get into the industry sometimes we only just want to put our little feet in just to get our toes wet you know mm -hmm. to try and see what's going on there uh communication needs to be better and i think that that part of authenticity where we talked about earlier comes into play we are afraid to well, maybe in asia more than mm -hmm than in America or in the Western world because you, you kind of get afraid to tell your managers, hey, can I try this? Can mm -hmm. I do that? And if nobody notices you, then you're like a diamond under a, under a rock, you know? You're like yeah. a hidden gem. Um, then your managers have to be the ones who are actually thinking outside of themselves and say like, you know, how, to, how instead of how can I run my business well, it's how can I treat my team better mm -hmm. and uh, help them fulfill their own goals in life. Yeah. Right. And then when you think outside of the box as a, as a, anybody as a management, we have appraisals. Appraisals are horrible to me. Mm. Appraisals are like a set of questions that you ask uh, because you have to. And a lot of managers just want to get over and be done with it. And that's why they do away with appraisals in many places or they forget to do it yeah. without any mandatory, um, um, you know, stuff. And, uh, when you truly care for your team, mm -hmm. transcend outside of yourself, you think about how can I help you achieve your goals? Yeah. How can I help you be who you really want to be? How can I make you happy as a person so that you come to work, you feel fulfilled, you, and you go home? And that's retention. Mm -hmm. Just like how you retain your customers, you retain the people who work for you. Yeah. That's an important bit right there, I think, is this, this the, the retention bit. Because... Yeah. And I think maybe it has to do a lot with self-transcendence. I mean, or it could be one area anyways of, of helping retention. Um, because yeah, you're right. If people don't feel fulfilled in their roles and they've spoken out or they're afraid to speak out and they're just not getting, you know, the, the next level, whatever that is, um, you know, after a while, I think people will want to try and move on to something else where they can feel that fulfillment. Or if they cannot, then you'll probably have a disgruntled team member 
who's going to yeah. sit there for 20 years, continuously being disgruntled, mm -hmm. coming to work, dragging their feet to work. And yeah. what, what good is that going to be? It's either that you let that person go because you cannot take it anymore, mm -hmm. or you let that person stay and that person's going to be that little um, cancer in your team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it right? doesn't make for a productive workplace at all. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, I mean, in all honesty, I can continue talking about this subject forever because I think it's so interesting and there are so many different facets of self-transcendence because you can do it in your personal lives as well. And that, you know, follows through into your work life. Um, I mean, I just have so many more questions, but obviously we just don't have the time. But um, I want to know from you a, a, a favorite quote. Like if we could just end this call with your favorite quote, what would that be? I would love to have you guess my favorite quote. Um, actually, to be honest, I don't have a favorite quote ever, but okay. this one really, really, I mean, um, hits me. Okay. And I think it kind of relates to what we're talking about today as well. Mm. It's a very famous quote by the famous Maya Angelou. Okay. And I've only heard of her when she passed away. So um, people will not remember what you say and people will not remember what you do but they will always remember how you made them feel. And that in itself is pretty amazing on the inside, isn't it? It is. It, yeah, that's a great quote to, to end this one. Um, and yeah, now it makes me want to go outside and do something nice for somebody. <laughs> oh, well, well. What you are doing is already something outside of your own good, you know, Andrea. So we don't notice a little bit of the, the things that we do that are good for people either yeah. right but when your mission or your vision right now or your mission basically is to help inspire the hospitality industry that's outside of your own self my dear. <laughs> you're, so you're you're think about these things <laughs> so this is the funny part about transcendence right is that a lot of us don't do it consciously we unconsciously have given out this energy to the world, but when you can engineer it to be a conscious action every day, you notice that I can do it. You don't do it because, you know, it's, I have to do it because it will make my job better. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you do it from your heart, it's not exhausting anymore. Yeah. You and do it because you want to, you want to influence, you want to inspire, you want to help. Yeah. And that comes from you. And as hospitality folks, um, for the people who are watching, you know, thinking about this topic of self-transcendence, what is it that you have done uh, within today, this week, this month, that you have actually self-transcended? I would love to know. I'm sure Kylie would love to know. So anything that you want to share with us, we would love to hear what you've been doing um, for self-growth and self-transcendence. So Kylie, thank you so much for being on this call. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to having more conversations. My pleasure.